There we go. Certainly our need is for our world to understand the, the, the its importance and the relevance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, let's admit something this morning. Our world, in terms of God, it's not getting better. And that's something we can all see. It doesn't take a genius or anybody of really any understanding to look around at the landscape of our world and discover when it comes to God that uh, we're not necessarily getting better in terms of uh, being more like the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that they were first called Christians in Antioch, and the reason why they were called that is because they mimicked the Lord Jesus Christ in his behavior, uh, in his thinking, in his talk, and really every facet of life did their best to look and act like the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would say something this morning. God hasn't changed the definition of Christianity. Can you agree with that this morning? Again, we're talking about the relevance of, of God, the relevance of ultimately God's Word. You and I and now today, we understand God really through His book. We understand God through the words that He left us. And really the treasure of Christianity is found in the wealth of, of change and, and more like Christ that we discover in the words that God has left us. Amen. I would say that video just a moment ago shared uh, really the, the issues of our world it shared uh, the, the seriousness of what's happening, that they're experiencing the pain and the destruction uh, that, that life really has without God. The Bible is very clear that mankind is born ultimately without God. And clearly, they're, they're, what they're experiencing in life, the pain, the, again, the, destru uh, the destruction that comes as a result of not knowing the Lord. And I would say as well, that's where the church comes in. That's really why we're here this morning. We want to encourage you wants you to learn more about God and as well at the same time be motivated to, to serve the Lord each and every day as you move through life and as you discover opportunities that the Lord brings your way to represent the Lord. I would say this, that Satan really is doing his very best, really doing his very best to steal away the hope uh, that rests in the Lord Jesus Christ as a viable answer for the issues of life. Would you agree with that or not? I don't know if you agree with that or not. You look around, people are looking in every place to find some answer to the conflicts and dilemmas of life, but often they do not turn to God himself. Matter of fact, they're turning in many multiple ways that seem religious, but really ultimately not towards God. Some are moving towards being a, a Muslim. Some are moving towards other, other religions or other issues looking for answers. And I would say this morning for the 2,000 years since the Lord has been on this earth, nothing's changed. The validity of Christianity and the relevance of God for people's lives is still there. Amen. By the way, I would say too, that's why uh, today we're having Mission 360. Today is what we call Mission 360 in our church this afternoon at uh, 2 o'clock. We're going to meet back here at the church and we're going to go through some of the options and opportunities that are associated with Mission 360. And let me ask you a question. How many of you have dinner plans with each other, I mean? Not near enough. How many of you, I don't answer this, just to yourself. How many of you are planning on going home for lunch? Just answer to yourself. And we're praying for you right now. I told you the last couple of weeks, if you go home, your chances of coming back at 2 o'clock reduce drastically. All right? So if you need a dinner date, all right, I'm open. My family's open. You can come with us, right? You pay. I'm more than happy to go with you, right? And uh, we're more, more, I, got, I got five people in my family. Uh, I got a son and daughter-in-law. That makes seven. We, we, we don't eat very much. Boy, have you seen my family? You know that's not true. Amen. We like to eat. But the point is that the challenge of coming back at 2 o'clock for Mission 360, honestly, the logistics of going home and eating or wherever you may go. And I know it's your nap time. I know it's Christian nap time at 2 o'clock. That's God ordained. Again, I know that, right? But to come back and be a part of something, that's really what we're talking about is the relevance of God. We have to believe in a premise. I knew I was going to do that. My 150-year-old Bible, I knew I was going to do that. What was I talking about? It's probably time for a nap now. Let's pray and go home, all right? The premise, again, is that we have to believe in something very simple. And it transcends the time of day. It transcends our location. 
It transcends who we're with. It transcends the church in the sense that it's the idea that God and his word is relevant for everyone everywhere. At any given time, it doesn't matter. And I understand the challenges, the idea of coming back again today. But listen, today, what happens at 2 o'clock today, we're just trying to encourage you and help you and channel you into an opportunity to meet the need and be relevant for people that you come in contact with every day. Well, the Lord has challenged us this year for the concept of, of being worthy. Again, our theme, it ties into the day, uh, the, the, the series of being relevant, uh, the idea of Mission 360. It's all connected because in the end, if our God is worthy, then God has made us worthy through our faith in Jesus Christ. And because we are worthy, the people we reach out to, they are worthy as well. Amen. Well, and I hope that stirs your heart. I hope the concept of the relevance of God's word and the issues of God at hand would, would move us forward to be relevant today, relevant tomorrow, and certainly a year from then. By the way, as a pastor, I understand, um, I'm fully aware that uh, we're independent Baptists. We have some visitors this morning. Thank you for being with us. I want you to know our independent Baptist feature, it only means we love the Lord. By independent, we, we really what we you know want to say to people, we, we don't tell visitors this, so if you're busy, I'm sorry you chose today. Okay, I'm sorry. Here's what independence means. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. Right? That's what independence means. Ultimately, what independent means is we, we choose through our belief that God is our authority in every way, shape, and, and form. That our, our concept of being Baptist, I understand what it means to be Baptist. Most Baptists have a bad name throughout the world. Got some visitors this morning. Baptists have a bad name throughout the world, typically. And can I tell you, I think Baptist is a good thing. I believe it's a good thing. But let's, let's face it, one more thought. Again, the idea that we are relevant. I understand the challenges of pastor. Boy, we live in Houston. And boy, when I first came to Houston, you know, there's churches everywhere. I wonder how many churches are in Houston. Uh, thousands of them. And honestly, uh, a lot of them, uh, a lot of churches can begin to fall into the, the snare, in my opinion, the snare of trying to be relevant and, in a sense, compete. For people. And I'm going to be honest with you, we're not in competition with other churches. Is that right? We're not in competition. You know what? We're, we're in war with Satan and against the gates of hell. That's what we're in competition. We want to call it that. And so we're not, we're not pursuing people. Uh, the idea of trying to be relevant, you know, churches have all kinds of ways to try to be relevant for people. Uh, we like our music. We, we, we like the, you know, everything we do in terms of that. By the way, we have some good coffee upstairs in the mornings. Brother Mark Shubbing just makes a mean cup of coffee. By the way, if you, have, if you don't have, haven't had breakfast, you can step on almost any one of the Sunday school classrooms. They have some breakfast. Amen. By the way, uh, uh, well, just yeah, actually, if you're not in one of those classes, just pick a class. It's all good food, right? Pick the best. The point is that relevance is not found in a breakfast item on Sunday morning. Relevance is not found in, in the music service. Relevance of God is not found in a facility. Relevance is not found just in who is doing the speaking. Relevance is not found in the choice of your seat. Relevance is found in a belief in a God that's greater than all things. That's what makes us relevant. And I would say to this morning, we can have the best cup of coffee around. Everybody claims to have that. Well, we can have the best facility, and we strive to have a nice, clean, comfortable, uh, God-honoring facility. We can have the best program, the best music. We can have the best specials. We can go through all the features. I can do my very best to be a good public speaker. But the reality is, in our heart, if we don't connect with God, we will not find relevance of God in our life. Let's come to one more quick premise, and that is simply this. One of the reasons why God is not relevant in the communities and places we live, I often believe is because God has not found relevance in the people who call themselves Christian. Now, that's a challenging thought, and I certainly not meant to be convicting. That's not my intention. I don't know anything about your heart. I don't know. God knows you know, and in the, in the end, if we can find the relevance of God in our own life, chances are we'll become relevant with God for people we meet. Boy, and that truth uh, really may resonate in our heart and our mind this morning. I know I'm preaching to the choir. I know uh, many of you uh, have certainly loved the Lord. You've certainly given uh, certainly a faith towards the Lord. You're here on a Sunday morning. And, uh, and I pray that as we investigate this concept of relevance in the Scriptures, that we would find a, a real challenge, but find some encouragement as well. If you need conviction, here's my prayers as a pastor. If you need conviction, may God give it to you. 
right? Conviction is a good thing. Conviction moves us from where we are to where we need to be. It's the reality that I'm maybe not where God wants me to be, but because God is stirring the heart, I can get there with the Lord's help. Conviction is a good thing. Maybe you need encouragement. Maybe you've done your absolute best and you're just downtrodden a bit. You're discouraged. Listen, God can give you encouragement through finding relevance of God in your heart. Maybe you're, uh, maybe you're plugging away and God just wants to keep you to, or use you to kind of splash over on other people and to be an encouragement to them. Whatever the case, uh, the premise again, that the Bible is still relevant and God is still relevant for the people of our world. By the way, here in just a few months now, we're going to face an election. And uh, I'll be honest with you, the things at this point don't, really don't look very good. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, there's a couple of people I think would be good maybe for our country and I don't know if they'll ever get elected. I don't know. I'll do my part, and I hope you do as well. As Christians, it's incumbent upon us to do and play our part uh, within our government, within our land, uh, to stand up for Christian values, amen, and that's one way you can do it. So I encourage you, don't let November come and not vote. Be sure to be in your place. Stand up for the Lord and voice your opinion in the way that our government gives you an opportunity in which to do so. But let's face it, let's come to a reality that a new president is not going to save our country. I don't care who it is. There's a few of them. We know they're not going to save our country, right? But in the end, you and I know the Scripture tells us, the relevance of God tells us that when a nation itself will turn its heart towards the Lord, that when people, individuals, families, marriages, married couples, when children turn their heart towards the Lord, that's when God really begins to do great and mighty things in the lives of people and families and nations when our nation is in desperate need of the Lord. Our nation is in desperate need of the relevance of God. And I want to encourage you again along, along these lines. Let's consider a couple of thoughts. I would say, again, the Bible, we must come to the premise of the Bible is still relevant. By the way, there are many more people today that are considering the Quran, or the Quran, however you pronounce it, as whether or not it's viable for life. And um, others are believing in the Book of Mormon. And there are many other books, and, uh, and I, I certainly want to be careful not to point fingers or cause uh, any, you know, any slander or anything like that. But here's the point. Somewhere along the way, people are losing faith in the Bible. Somewhere along the way, our Christian nation that was based upon God, somewhere along the way, we're, we're losing the premise that the Bible is still the place to go. It's still the place to go find answers. It's still the place in which to rest and implant your life into the teachings of God. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and you know the verse of Scripture, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. By the way, again, let's remind ourselves of those four things that the Lord mentions in verse 16. All those things pretty much cover your life. There's not really a lot of things in life that don't fall into one of those four categories, doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness. Every feature and facet of life gets in there somewhere, and certainly God telling us what's right, telling us what's wrong, telling us where things need to be corrected, and then how to keep things right before God. The Bible does all of that because in God said this in the Scripture, is given by the inspiration of God. Well, let's make sure we understand that concept. It's not just that the Bible is inspiring. The Bible is inspired. That's a big difference. People look at the Bible and say, well, boy, that just moves my heart. That's a good story. Listen, it's more than just a story. It is the words of God, and God has inspired these words unlike any other book. Unlike any other word. I'm amazed. As I open my Bible and I read, I, matter of fact, we just taught in Sunday school this morning. Uh, we finished a, a lesson on the story of Naaman. Have you ever heard of Naaman? Naaman was a, a, a Syrian general, and he was a leper. You read, you read about the story of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5, about the, really about the first 20 or so verses. It's an unbelievable story. I mean, it's, it's incredible what God does in this man's life. But I'm going to tell you, the story of Naaman, is, again, it's not like a child's book story that God just puts in the Bible. It says, hey, pay attention because this is inspiring to you. God has told us that I have chosen every word, and every word is inspired, and God said there's life in that word, and I have given it life because he is God. The astounding thing about that is I can pick up a child's book on the shelf of my family, in our 
library and I can pick up a book there and read another childhood story that's just a good story and it's not the same. Same words. Same words in terms of English words, but not the same. God has inspired his word. And God has preserved those words. And the, the premise then that God is still relevant and that God is still good. Boy, our basis of believing in God and believing in the words that he has given to us. All scripture is given and certainly the hope of the scripture. Romans chapter 3 verse 25 gives us the hope of the past. You can take time. We don't have time this morning to read all the verses. Romans, uh, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 and 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 1 gives us the hope of our present. So the hope of, our, of the past, uh, the, again the Bible declares that Christ is the hope of today. The Bible says in Revelation 19.10 that he is the hope of the future. Talks about that issue. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5, that if we have hope, that our hope makes us not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In other words, if he's the hope of the past, the hope of today, the hope of tomorrow, then why today, why today not live in the hope of Christ? And the relevance of God and his word in life. Mission 360 is really based on that premise. The idea that the church being the church is really the effort of the church to connect people who are stuck and, and, and under the destruction and the pain and the sorrow of life without God. It's the effort of the church to connect those people to Jesus Christ, believing that he is relevant for their life. Now, however that may come about, however that avenue may take place, maybe, maybe it's on the job, maybe it's on the run, for you and I, we must be ready at all times to share Christ with whomever uh, may need an answer to the issues of life. I encourage you to be ready tomorrow. Be ready now. Be ready at a moment's notice and be prepared at all times because in the end, we must help connect people to God. Now let's consider the relevance. And the title of the message is a book for all generations. I would say that, um, again, as we have the book in, in the form that we have it in today, uh, listen, let's face it, it hasn't always been this way. It hasn't always been this way. Matter of fact, in terms of history, this is really still a new thing. It's, you know, in this particular form, this is still a pretty new thing. And, and the idea that the book, God, is relevant for all generations, I would say that if God was good for the very first human being on the planet, that I would say God is going to be good for the last one on the planet too. I would say that God is good for everybody in between. And, and the idea today is that there's this creeping in idea that God has become irrelevant for our society. And I'm telling you, if God has been good from the creation of time, he's good through all that time, and he's good for any generation to come. And our belief in that must be in place. Let's consider, first of all, a generation without the Scripture. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and... I want us to consider this concept of the relevance of God, and I want us to consider it, first of all, in terms of the, the, the generations that have come and gone and will come and go, and, and really, ultimately, being without God. Now, Romans chapter 1, if you know your Bible, the Bible begins to tell us about life without God. By the way, as you're turning there, let me ask you a quick question, kind of a, kind of a setup thing here. How many of you remember life before cell phones? You remember that time? That, that, where's, where's the teenagers? They're all, they're all uh, some of them in the back, some college kids back there. Where's, where's our teenagers at? Some of you teenagers. Uh, like my kids, for example, they don't remember life without one of these. Right? By the way, how many of y'all remember the cord that used to be attached? You remember the cord? I remember, um, you know, we, we thought that was just normal. By the way, I remember, I remember the day we got a 50-foot phone cord. You remember that one? Anywhere in the house, man, that was a big day, you know. You come out of the room and there's this cord that snakes throughout the house and you wonder who's on the other end of the line and sure enough, you go to that place, the door's closed because they want some privacy, you know. You remember those days? I remember a few times my mom and dad threatened to choke me with that phone cord that was attached on the phone. You remember that? Nowadays, nowadays we, uh, you know, we have in this form, and by the way, this thing, this thing's not just a phone. My wife and I were traveling around Tomball yesterday and and we were just kind of sightseeing, beautiful day, and we decided to get it. By the way, we, we ran the 99 yesterday. It's open, and, and they said it was for free. Otherwise, we just paid $27. 
<laughs> they said it was free. I hope so. Otherwise, i got to pay a bill. And we ran all the way from 45, get this, for all the way from 45 all the way to 290 in under 20 minutes. By the way, we, we were not speeding. We did the limit. And it's a great thing. We just drive. It's a beautiful road. I guess if roads are beautiful, you know. And we're in areas we've never been in before in, the, in this area. So we decided to get off the 99 and go through and sightsee. We like to do that. We like to take drives. We wound up someplace out there in north towards Magnolia somewhere. And honestly, Magnolia streets aren't very straight. We got out there yesterday. I was like, honey, I don't even know where we are. I don't know where we're at. We've got to pull out the phone and get the GPS app. I remember thinking, what did we do before we had GPS on the phone? We pull over and call somebody from their phone, right? right Mom, where am I? Help me out. Do you know how to get in? Go down to the oak tree and hang a left, you know, one of those deals. And the idea of, you know, life before cell phones. What, what is life without God like? Well, what was life? Do you remember what life was like before you got saved? Do you remember like what life was like before you came to faith in Jesus Christ? Listen, that's what God says every generation from the beginning of time. That's what every generation is experiencing is life without God. Romans chapter 1 describes it. We read back in the time of Adam, and certainly as Adam sinned, plunged the human race into sin, the Bible begins to give us some of the ideas about history, about the history of mankind. Romans chapter 1 talks there about the spiritual perversions. We don't have time this morning to go into all the details. The spiritual perversions, if you look in Romans chapter 1, and beginning in verse number 21, here's what it says. That when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of God, of the uncorruptible God, into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Are you capturing that? God describes the condition of mankind without God and without His Word, and ultimately there begins to be a spiritual perversion take place in life. If you read through the Bible history accounts, it's not long after Adam that even his own family begins to divert away from God. There's a verse in Genesis chapter 6, uh, chapter 5 verse 6, chapter 6 verse 6, where it says that, that man's thoughts were only evil continually. His, his idea that now I am wise because we don't agree with God and therefore we change God into whatever our wisdom says we can turn him into. Pretty soon, so severe is the spiritual perversion that God wipes the face of the earth from man. Think not for a moment that the generation of, of Noah, if you will, that ultimately the conclusion was God's not relevant. They began to change. Romans chapter 1 also speaks of emotional perversion. I want you to see again in verse number 21 through verse 24. Again, it talks about they became vain in their imaginations, in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. A darkened heart also speaks to emotional perversions. They, they profess themselves to be wise, and yet they became fools. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Listen, there's an emotional perversion that begins to follow when there's a spiritual perversion when man says God is not relevant. And if you look across the landscape of society, our world is plunged into an emotional perversion. People think that they can trust their own heart. People think that their heart and their emotional state is what matters. People thrive on the emotional responses to life that are fueled by a sin nature. And they think it's right. People think anger is okay. People think that covetousness is okay. Whatever you have, I want. And I, I think that's a good thing. And I'm going to get what I decide is good for me. And, and I don't want God. He's not relevant. Therefore, now my emotional state is all over the radar. By the way, you ever met someone like that? By the way, we used to be that way before we were saved. Prayerfully, we're not that way now. Prayerfully, what God begins to bring in the relevance of God 
is not just the conclusion that God is good for life, but that he begins to affect the very emotional state of our hearts and our minds, number one, to know who we are, number two, to know who God is, and the relevance of God in my conditions of my life. One of the features of the Bible is very clear. Well, I'm quoted there from Romans chapter 3, where it says, Hope maketh not ashamed. That passage of Scripture to, speaks to the emotional value that God brings into life because of his relevance. The Bible says there in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, And we glory also in tribulations, knowing that tribulations worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Now, did you capture that? The love of God is shed abroad by the Holy Ghost in us, and it affects our endurance. It affects our emotional stability in the hope of Christ. It affects our endurance of life. It affects why and how we go through the challenges of life. Some of you have been through some terrible situations in life, and yet God has brought you through, first and foremost, because God's relevance for your emotional state is valid and real to you. What an incredible point. And yet in, in, in Romans chapter 1, we see a generation without God where they first of all have a spiritual perversion, they move away from God, they change the image of God, and now their hearts and minds begin to have an emotional instability. And then finally that gives way to moral perversion. Look there in chapter 1 of Romans and beginning in verse number 26, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me. By the way, we don't like talking about this verse. Most people that are in our world today, even in Christian circles, just don't want to, they ignore this portion of Scripture. And by the way, it's not the particular here. What I want you to see is the moral perversions. Somewhere along the way, and by the way, I've heard this and I've read this, I've heard stories, I've had people tell me, you know, when it comes to the moral perversion, and it's funny there, within the generations that God begins to talk about, uh, of life without God, without the relevance of God. It's funny, of all the things God could mention in terms of perversion, there's one perversion at the top of the list. Men with men and women with women. Many people have said, I've heard it, they've told me, God made me this way. Listen to me, the Bible, did you read that? Did you capture that? It says where they did change the natural use. Did you capture that? Men with men, women with women. In other words, God doesn't make people that way. It's a choice of theirs because of the perversion. And by the way, the bigger picture is somewhere along the way, a generation has said, God is not relevant. God is not relevant for our spiritual conditions and spiritual dilemmas. God is not relevant for our emotional state. And God is not relevant for a moral compass in life. And by the way, please understand, I'm doing my best not to point fingers and be slanders, anything like that. We have to come to one simple conclusion. The society has said God is not relevant, but we must come down firmly and say we believe wholeheartedly without reservation that God is relevant for our work. The moral perversion, the emotional perversion, the spiritual perversion. And finally, finally it gives away to scriptural perversion. I want you to see here, begin in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, or not proper, not appropriate, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. Jump down to verse number 31. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful. Listen here, verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. 
not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Listen, there's one thing here you begin to see is that all this kind of gives way to a scriptural perversion. They knew God. Did you capture that verse 32? They knew what God said, who knowing the judgment of God. By the way, they cannot know the judgments of God against such things unless somewhere they know where God stands on the issues. You cannot say, I know what God says about that without knowing how God and where he stands on the issues at hand, who knowing the judgments of God, not only do the same things, but have pleasure in them. By the way, many people today, one of the real detriments of society, of a life without the relevance of God, it's funny how they begin to change what right and wrong looks like. They begin to rewrite it. You with me on that? Well, those things are serious issues. And I understand. I mean, we're Christians, right? We're, again, I, I'm preaching to the people I see on almost every Sunday. Some of you I don't know very well, but the point being that God is a God who is relevant. And yet we see generations of people that don't know God. By the way, I wonder which generation God is talking about in Romans chapter 1. Is he talking about Adam's generation? Is he talking about the generation of Genesis chapter 5, chapter 3? Is he talking about Cain's generation there in Genesis chapter 4? Is he talking about the generation that followed after the, uh, after the ark and after the, the flood there in Genesis chapter 11? Is he talking about the generation of Genesis chapter 37 where the horrible, horrific deeds of sin just fall off the pages, make you want to turn the page as you read through the Bible because of the horrible issue? Is he talking about the generation of Exodus chapter 1? Is he talking about the generation of Numbers 13 and 14? Is he talking about the generation of Daniel and Daniel chapter 9? Maybe he's talking about the generation that put our Savior to death in Matthew chapter 27. Maybe he's talking about the generation of the Apostle Paul in, in A.D. 50 where they put many Christians to death. Maybe he's talking about the generations for the last 1,500 years where they've lived life and determined that God God is not relevant. The conclusion is simply this. He's talking about all generations. Any generation fits into Romans chapter 1. And the reality of God's teaching is that in this context, God is talking about every generation where they determine that God is not relevant. We have some history on generations without God. You and I are... Uh, we're privileged to be able to sit here today and do what we're doing. By the way, if I were to preach what I'm preaching now in certain places in the world, I'd be killed. You know that. If I openly did what I'm doing now, they would arrest me and probably put me to death within hours. We have a freedom in America that we've taken for granted for a long time. And, uh, but the reality is we have a long history. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago uh, the, the pastor in New York City that uh, they were trying to recover a building that was built in 1847. There was a church building right in the heart of New York City in Brooklyn, actually, where they had built it uh, previous to the Civil War. During the Civil War, they uh, formed a church there in 1863. While Gettysburg is going on not too far away, there's an independent Baptist church in Brooklyn, New York, that is formed and established, and the church building is still there. Here in 2016, a few weeks ago, I heard of a pastor that is going back to that building. That building has been condemned in Brooklyn, New York. They're trying to raise the funds to restore the building. And he says one thing. He says, as, in, as Baptist, an independent Baptist in America, by the way, that is the oldest formed independent Baptist church in America. He says this. Boy, just strum the, 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 the strings of my heart. Here's what he said. He said, we need to maintain our history. That history matters. You and I have a history, don't we? Well, a couple of ways to look at that. We have a history of sin, if you want to call it that. Our time before God, our time before the relevance of God really made an impact. And, and we have our life previous to God. And for some of you, you can give a large testimony of the, of the devastation of, the, of that life previous to God. 
But then we have a testimony of, of rich grace and blessing and mercy in life after God came to be a part of our life. And really since your salvation prayerfully, you're experiencing the blessing of God in life. And, and that history is just as important. Matter of fact, I would submit to you that your history of God's impact in your life is just as significant as when you came to Christ in salvation. Because in the end, what God has done for you since your salvation ought to be more impressive than what he did to save you. Amen. Now, in the end, we have a history. You think about us this morning. I have my Bible here. And, and uh, by the way, I, I've, I've done something. My, my, uh, I buy a new Bible every 10 years. I, am, uh, I bought this Bible uh, back in 2010. And so I'm five, six, going on six years into this one. Four years, I'll put this aside. And uh, my, my plan is over 50 years of ministry to have five Bibles. So I have five kids. Give one Bible to each one of my kids for a 10-year period of my ministry and of the Lord's work in my life. And by the way, I think this is number three or four. I've got several more years to go, amen. But I think about my Bible, and prayerfully, my, my Bible will be as important to my kids as, as my great-great-grandfather's is to me. The history of the Bible and the history of God. Did you know there wasn't always, I said it earlier, there wasn't always in these forms in terms of a book. You go back to the time of Moses where God wrote on stone his word. And for centuries, matter of fact, I still firmly believe the tables of stone are still uh, intact and still in God's possession. Certainly they are. And I believe that certainly the, the history of the Bible and the history that God has given in the form of the written word. There was a time when, when the history of the Bible was on stone. There came a time when the history of the Bible was written meticulously on the scrolls throughout history. Matter of fact, for centuries, they were contained on scrolls. Matter of fact, in 1948, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in, in, the, in, the, in Israel, that, that they discovered that the, 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 the scrolls of the Dead Sea Scrolls went back a thousand years previous to anything they had currently. And it proved not only the validity and the accuracy of God's Word, but it also proved how they maintained it and, and the importance of the documents upon which it was written. The scrolls were meticulously maintained by the scribes for centuries. Into what you and I know as the time after Christ, they began to be placed on codex or codices as it's known. And these were portions of scriptures that were written on loose pieces of papyrus and they were often folded together in somewhat of a book form and they were used as such codex or codices, and that went on for some time, there came a time when the common man did not have the Bible in their hand. There came a time in certainly the dark ages when men were without the Bible. They didn't have, if you will, a scroll in their possession. Matter of fact, the scrolls were so significant, you did not put them in your pocket. Matter of fact, they were mostly contained with, within churches and monasteries throughout the dark ages, and only large churches had the contents of an incomplete scripture of God. During a time, only the very, very wealthy were able to even have a personal copy. They're referred to, as you know, in history as the Dark Ages because often the light of God was not found in a personal life. It was contained within the hands of a few wealthy and a few very high-ranking, if you will, church people. And the reality is that man was without the things of God. Time came when in monasteries and things such as that, that they would pin the scriptures meticulously. There came a time in 1450 when a printing press was invented, as you know, and the printing press began to mass produce it. By the way, you know the, the effect of when you mass produce God's word and begin to put it in the common man's hands? You know what happens? It's called revival. It's called revival. A couple of main people you've heard about, one guy named Martin Luther, another, game, another man you may not know a whole lot about by the name of John Hess, and Mr. Hess also, like Martin Luther, were men that as they got the word of God into their hand after centuries of the common man not having it, and they began to read what the Bible said, they discovered it's not what they had heard. They discovered it's not what was being taught. They discovered it's not what was being shared. And they discovered that within the Bible, there's something here that's more important than what men tell me. It's called the Word of God. And I would say to you today, 
since the uh, invention of the printing press, books like my great-great-grandfather's Bible have been made. And the book that I use on a consistent basis for my children was ultimately came. But can I tell you, we're in the midst of a new revolution, if you will, a new revelation, a, a growing time of God's Word. Can I be honest with you? Some of you are using things like this today. I have my message on my iPad. Can I confess to you? It's the very first time I've ever used an iPad to preach a message. But I'll tell you why. It's not for this message. God has some irony involved. I couldn't get the printer to work this morning. My computer and the printer wouldn't connect. I looked at Brother Chuck, and I was like, what do I do now? He said, well, just use your iPad. I was like, how? How do I do that? I'm old school. I like my paper. So now I'm having to use my iPad. By the way, you, you know, you can move it around, shrink it, make it large. Pretty cool. Some of you are using media. Well, when, when the printing press came around and put the Bible into the hands of people, it was a pretty revolutionizing idea. They say, some say today that the media advancements of today with God's Word is just as revolutionized, if not more so than the printing press. But can I tell you, can I tell you this morning, it's not about an iPad or, or a particular book. You with me on this? You with me? It, it's, it's about God's Word, and it's about the relevance of God in the life of people. By the way, I'll still use my Bible. As soon as I get the printer to work, I'll put this away probably. And I'll use my Bible, and I'm okay with that. Whatever you use in your life, okay, whatever. It's okay. The question we have for ourselves, is God relevant to us? Is God relevant? In the history of mankind, we, we find where our history as Christians is marred by a time where men were not allowed to have the Word of God. It was re reserved and, and removed away from them for them to be able to have God's Word in their hands. We come to a generation in Romans chapter 1 where God declares the perversions of a generation without God. And yet here we stand. Here we stand today. On a Sunday morning, God's day, when we stand with the idea that we are once again reminded and affirming our belief in God and His Word as the relevant message for the world in which we live. I would say that uh, the same Word of God that Martin Luther read and changed his life is the same Word of God you can read today and change yours. The people of our world really today, they just don't know what God says. Never taken the time to read it through. Never taken the time to study. And yet I would say to you, because of our belief in God and His Word, it's the very reason why we as the church stand here today to be the connection between people and God of heaven. May God use us to be relevant to the people that He's put in front of us. Amen. May God cause us to have a reaffirmed belief and trust and faith in the Bible in every way, shape, and form. So I ask you this morning, I ask you, do you believe in the relevance of God? Can I remind you that it's not just your affirmation of maybe the preaching of God's Word that says, yeah, I agree with that, Pastor, but maybe it's when you get up out of your chair in a few minutes and you walk out the door what your life looks like on the other side. Maybe it's a matter of God even this morning saying to you that there's things in life that we need to deal with. We need to have some business done. Come meet with me. Let's make some decisions. Because if you leave the door without making a decision that you know God wants you to make, listen, you're saying in essence, God is not relevant to me. God is not relevant for the choices of my life. For some of us, it's a matter of falling down before the throne of God and coming to the conclusions and assenting that God is right and good. By the way, let's remind ourselves that God is always right. God is never wrong. And for those who say, well, the Bible is full of contradictions, may I remind you again that even though we say that God is full of contradictions, just as Romans chapter 1 said, that we can determine that God, God is not relevant, so we go a different direction. Maybe the reality is that God is always right. We just didn't know. We just didn't know. Maybe in the end, by our conclusion that God is right, God begins to change us as he uses us to change the world. Why not? Why not? God is a God for all generations, and he's given us a book that's good for everyone. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning. 
Father, for the challenge that you've given to us in life. Father, thank you for, Lord, thank you for giving us Romans chapter 1. Father, we read that portion of Scripture in our hearts. Father, are just overcome with the reality of the situation. Father, realizing, Lord, what every generation goes through without you. And Father, we come to the place this morning where each of us here today must conclude, Lord, that you're relevant for every life. Father, beginning with ours, beginning with our life, beginning with our choices, Lord, beginning with our belief. And Father, as we not only understand the history of the world without you, but Father, we understand the history of Christianity, Lord, and those that live life without you, Lord, and yet had great faith. Father, may we today have great faith because our belief. Father, I pray that you look into our hearts now. Father, move us from where we are to where you want us to be. Father, in the end, may we always give glory back to you. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Well, we're glad this morning to have a need for a baptism. We're going to take a couple of moments and got a couple of kiddos who need to come and follow the Lord in believers' baptism. They've certainly been saved. Today is just a celebration of what God's done for them. So we'll turn it over to Brother Chuck and Joy. Good morning. Let me just first say this feels really weird in this choir robe. I should have wore this earlier in the morning <laughs> instead of now. So anyways, we're glad we've had a great morning so far. And what better way to conclude our service this one with a couple of baptisms. So we're going to get started right now. We're going to have Reagan Craddock come on down. This is Reagan Craddock. Reagan, you know you trusted Christ as your Savior? Yes, sir. Upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. This is Everett. Everett, you know you trusted Christ as your Savior? Yes, sir. Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my little brother, and in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Thank you, Brother Chuck. That never gets old, does it? <laughs> 